Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, A New Way to Do Team Building, hosted by HRDQU and presented by Gary Turner. My name is Sarah, and I will moderate today's webinar. The webinar will last about an hour, and so if you have any questions, feel free to type those into the questions area in your GoToWebinar control panel. You can click on the word questions. It'll make the box bigger. Type in there. Click Submit. That'll come over to me, and I'll either answer those as we go along or at the end of the session, given what time we have. If we run out of time for all of the questions, we will respond to all of them by email. So don't hesitate type in those questions, send them over to us. Today's webinar content is from our Jungle Escape game. This is a classroom experiential activity. Gary's going to talk about the importance of team building and share how one way of, of how to do that. And that's the foundation of today's session is this Jungle Escape game. So if you're interested in delivering this training within your organization, please contact HRDQ. And now give a warm welcome for our presenter today, Gary Turner. Gary is a senior fa faculty member of HRDQ. He completed his PhD coursework at The Ohio State University and was Organization Development Director at M&M Mars for nine years. He founded Turner Consulting in 1991, where he has worked with Fortune 500 companies in the US and in seven other countries. Welcome, Gary, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Sarah. You know, probably all of you listening have gone through some type of team building. And my lifetime of team building has taught me that teams have difficulty seeing themselves. That's why it's important to have some standard measurements to see how well a team is performing. Uh, you, can, you can gauge the performance of the team against some type of standard. So today, we are going to look at uh, how a team balances and uses their planning time and implementation time for team tasks and work. And, and we'll see in general the amount of time a team allots to planning and implementation phases of a project determines in part how effectively that team will operate. We will also look at the simulation that, that Sarah mentioned, Jungle Escape and show how it illustrates all those dynamics of effective teamwork. And we're going to look at some actions you can take today and put to use tomorrow. Uh, you can leave this, this discussion with more tools in your kit to see how teams see themselves. And, and in the end of this, as Sarah mentioned, we're gonna answer any questions that come in during the webinar. So anytime you have a question, type it in. So why is improving teamwork so important? Well. There's hundreds of ways to answer this question, and I'll bet everyone on this call has a different way of answering it. Here, here's a small list of some things I've heard in sessions over the years. I have seen in working with teams that these improvements are best op obtained by, by having a team work together to plan how to improve things, and then the team working together to implement the plan changes. In times past, a lot of our improvements were through technology and through work processes. But, but what we see today is that the biggest improvements that can be made are by working as a team to plan what to do and then by implementing those things. Okay, I'd like you to take a piece of paper and just jot down right now three things you would like your team or a team you're consulting with to work on to improve. Okay, so I'm giving you a second here. Just jot down some things that that team needs to improve. Okay, it's most likely going to take planning together with the team and then working together as a team to accomplish those three things you just jotted down. Well, here's the model we're going to use today, a very simple model uh, that talks about uh, different types of teams. And we're going to look at various factors today that cause a team to have those characteristics. Now, to think about this between fragmented, divergent, cohesive, I'd like you to think just for a second about a five-person bowling team versus a five-person basketball team. 
In a bowling team, you have rather independent work. People just take their own ball, they roll at their time, and they just do the best they can as an individual to accomplish the best score they can as an individual. And the more the five individuals are able to accomplish, the better the team does. But with a basketball team, and the NBA playoffs, incidentally, have just started, and I'm all excited about a couple teams, and it's interesting to see them having to work together, having to block for each other, pass to each other, uh, having them uh, basically work and run uh, kind of uh, the plays that they have. And, and it requires a lot of planning to be able to do that. A lot more planning than a bowling team has to put into what they do. So the basketball team has a little more uh, of a tendency to have to be cohesive in order to win. Now, a bowling team could be very fragmented and still do a good job if the five individuals just have the skills that it takes to get the highest number of pins possible. Well, the reason this is important is if we look at fragmented teams, today's workplace often creates fragmented teams. People have individualistic goals, like a sales team, and each individual has their own goal of what they have to make. And so the individual salespeople are all focused only on themselves and not upon what their team is doing. Or maybe the work structure itself divides people up so that they really don't work together and they're not interdependent. I worked on a team when I was a young uh, trainer that had a complete lack of team planning. We never got together for meetings or anything. And we were very fragmented. There, there was a lot of tension on that team because we just didn't work together as a team to plan. Or maybe it's fragmented because there's a lot of top-down leadership. And I like to sometimes call this fragmented team a group, not a team, because they're just a group of independent workers. Cohesive teams become much more interdependent. And somewhere in the middle of this, we have divergent teams, teams that have some cohesion or have some things that pull them together, but individuals on the team are sometimes trying to work in very divergent or different ways. Now, it takes a lot of extra effort to build cohesion in a team. And one of the main efforts that has to happen is for the team to see themselves. They have to understand the dynamics of what's going on in that team. <clears throat> and throughout this presentation now, we're going to describe some of the effort needed to build a cohesive team. So let's start with fragmented first, and let's dive deep here a little bit, and let's look at what are some of the things that create a fragmented team. First of all, autocratic leadership or clicks that press the team into making uh, quick decisions uh, are two of the biggest things I've seen on teams. Um, when you have one leader who just uh, is a completely under a command and control kind of approach, uh, the situation uh, allow, doesn't allow a team to really feel like they are working together, but that each person's doing an individualistic job. And so this situation results in insufficient time and effort allocated to considering alternative strategies for accomplishing the project or the work that they do. Extremely fragmented groups may spend very short time in planning and may not complete the project or task in an allocated time. Uh, fragmented teams uh, often may <clears throat> display some of these things, a lack of involvement and participation by all team members, or one person or a minority of the group makes the vital decisions, and will all sometimes see conflict, or I like to say disagreement, being suppressed <clears throat> or ignored, and if the project bogs down, the frustration or um, if you had just asked me reactions become kind of evident on the team. Now, some group members might feel good about the project, work, or job they have, uh, but a lot of others may not uh, feel good. So that's fragmented teams. So let's look at divergent teams some uh, for a while here. Divergent teams often have passive leadership in some way. 
instead of that autocratic leadership we saw in a fragmented group, we see a leader who doesn't provide either direction on task or doesn't provide process for the team, how the team ought to work together. And so group members tend to be overly cautious in a problem solving or decision making mode. They sometimes feel they're walking on thin ice. Uh, maybe too many alternatives are considered during the planning phase. And it results in a log jam in the planning and a little time left for implementation. Divergent teams also tend to display these characteristics too. They're, they're unable to reach consensus. Uh, they try to resolve their issues through voting procedures. And although group members may go along with the majority, there is little commitment to the plan or the final product. And, and finally, most group members are not satisfied with the group effort. Uh, they feel like they could have maybe done it better themselves. Now let's look at uh, a cohesive team. A cohesive team has a much more balance in, in planning and uh, much more balance in, in the way they implement uh, the work to achieve their goals. There's much more of a cooperative atmosphere and that atmosphere develops very rapidly when they get together to talk. Everyone on the team feels some involvement in structuring the work or the outcomes. And in general, uh, this team spends a lot uh, less time sometimes uh, in looking at uh, what they're doing and, and especially the potential problems because they can iron out the problems a lot better. And so consequently, if you consider the word, let's look at total time between planning and implementation of a project. Total time is usually less than is required by fragmented or divergent teams. And so cohesive teams display some of these characteristics. They use more democratic processes in planning and implementing the project or if conflict or disagreement arises, it's addressed and worked through, or people feel excited and committed and involved in the, in the project or the work. And cohesive teams feel uh, a lot more satisfaction with the team effort and their part in the team effort. So there's a lot better feelings about team members. Uh, I like to say that a cohesive team not only produces better performance, but it produces better morale. It helps people feel more energized by working with each other. So how do we get to have a cohesive team? Let's look at nine elements now. These are nine elements of teamwork. Um, and these are written in a way that show if we have these things, we would have cohesive teamwork. So let's go down uh, each of the three columns here. In the first column, we see the cooperative and supportive climate, clear goals and objectives, a healthy conflict management. In the second column, meaningful environment, uh, agreed upon problem solving method, uh, open communication. And in the third column, we see shifting leadership, different people taking the leadership at times, uh, some consensus and decision making. And finally, some task satisfaction, feeling good about what they're doing. Now, of course, these are written in the positive. And if we don't have these things, it minimizes the amount of cohesion we can have. For instance, if we have an uncooperative climate in the first column, or a second thing, we don't have clear goals, or the third thing, we don't have a good way of handling our conflict. Or in the second column, if we don't feel involved in what's going on, or we don't know the problems that we, we don't know or understand the way we're approaching this problem. Or if we just have uh, closed communication, we're not open about things and so forth. You can see we would not have near as much cohesion. So if a team has all nine of these elements, these critical elements, uh, we're going to see that there is a high probability they're gonna be extremely cohesive. And the more a team lacks these elements, the more obvious it is that they'll be very uh, fragmented or very, uh, in some way, working in diverse ways that, that aren't bringing them together. 
So let's describe these nine elements actually in a little more detail. Let's put some concrete anchors on what they are. So let's look here at climate. Let's say we score a 10 on uh, being cooperative and supportive, or a 10 on a sense of interest of what's going on. We, we would have those anchors would show us we must have a good climate or in involvement. If, if my unique skills are being used and I'm feeling a lot of productivity and satisfaction, I, I must be involved. <clears throat> if the leadership rotates uh, and we're, we feel like we're helping others and collaborating with other people, we must have shared leadership in some way. And goal setting, if, if there's a clear purpose for the goal and, and the scope of the, what we're working on, or if the team sets realistic goals that, that I feel good about, um, this commitment toward the goal helps us feel better as a team. Or in problem solving, if, if there's quick acknowledgement about what the problem is, especially root cause of what, what the, the deeper issues are in the problem or if we have agreed upon process of problem solving, uh, it helps us feel better as a team. In decision-making, if each member feels like they've had some input, uh, they maybe didn't get everyone to agree with what they wanted, but at least they felt uh, like they were heard. And if there is some consensus that is not necessarily total agreement, but at least people are willing to live with the decision. And in conflict, I, I like to call again conflict disagreement. If, if we see this disagreement as an opportunity uh, to rethink this, not a problem. And if it creates some type of creative thinking uh, atmosphere, then we're, we're having some good conflict management. In communication, if there's real active listening, we really hear what other people are saying. And if we're welcoming towards ideas that are di different than ours, uh, we're opening up that communication channel. And finally, in team satisfaction, if I'm pleased with both efforts and results, and we celebrate our success in some way, maybe not, I'm not talking about celebrate by having a cake, I'm just talking about we're happy inside. We feel some joy inside over what we were able to do. These, these show some anchors that, that are really pretty strongly cohesive and really pull some people together. So these keys um, help us work as a really highly cohesive team. Uh, so let me tell you a story about something that happened, I'm afraid almost 20 years ago, but it left a lasting impact upon me. It made me realize how important these nine elements are. Um, I was working with an HR department at a smaller size pharmaceutical company. And uh, I was working with the HR department and uh, I was brought in actually by uh, the VP of HR, said he wanted to, uh, to get, get the team together and just kind of look at how they're doing. And he thought they were doing very well, but it was time for an annual kind of retreat. And uh, he thought I could probably help them in some way. His name was Bud. Well, uh, so I talked to Bud and he kept saying how great his team was and so forth. So I asked, well, do you mind if I interview your team members before we have our day together? Uh, and he said, oh, that would be great. So he, out of his, I think seven or eight direct reports, I think it was seven, you know, like a, a director of benefits and a director of compensation and a director of recruiting and director of training and, and so forth. He had me interview, I think four of them. And it was interesting with all four as I taught, I asked questions about how the team worked together. All four of them said, oh, this team does not work well at all. Uh, there's a lot of problems on this team. And the more I probed and asked them questions about it, one of the biggest things all four people told me is how hard it was to work with Bud. And the, the same theme came through all four people, that Bud is very controlling. Bud will ask me to do something. I'll go work on it a bit. And then he wants a report. I bring him the report. He asked me to leave. <laughs> he then asked me to leave it with him. And he's going to take care of it. And so Bud gets engaged and involved in it and, and uh, 
slices and cuts and changes and and really makes it different than what I had originally started working on. <clears throat> and and it's interesting because Bud doesn't talk to me about those changes. He doesn't communicate what those changes are. He just makes the changes himself. So I was really looking forward to doing the exercise we're going to talk about in a little bit, Jungle Escape. Because Jungle Escape has them work together for 30 minutes. And some of their true nature comes out. So anyway, we start this uh, experiential exercise. Uh, and it was interesting. Bud kind of sat back with his arms folded at first. And everyone else seemed to be getting involved and, and working on this exercise. And they had 30 minutes to do it. And at about 15 minutes, Bud started unfolding his arms and taking pieces of the puzzle they were working on, the game they were working on. And he started doing it. And pretty soon, at about 20 minutes, he had gathered all the pieces around himself. He wasn't talking to anyone, just like they had said. And he was just putting the helicopter together all by himself. And you could see the rest of the team sitting there with their arms folded now and kind of frustrated at what was going on. And so Bud's true nature came out. Um, it was really amazing. So when we debriefed, you know, I, I asked people, you know, what happened in this game? And it started coming out. Look what Bud did. And and the analogies between what Bud did in that game and what Bud does at work started coming out. And I could see Bud sitting there taking it in, realizing the light bulb was going off. Yes, I do sort of work this way. And Bud then started confessing a lot about how he doesn't like to initiate things. He doesn't like to get things started, but he likes to complete things. He likes to take control at some point and do things his way. And so there was a lot of open communication. There was a lot of problem solving around that. The disagreements about what that does came out. The feelings came out. And there was a big realization by the point of everyone in the room, uh, including Bud, about what the dynamics were of that team and how they were working together. And so when they came to action planning, there was a lot that was talked about that day. And at the end of the day, as I'm, I'm leaving, Bud came to me and said, this was absolutely amazing. Uh, I never expected anything like this. Uh, I, I never realized, I guess, the impact I was having on my team and and uh, what I was doing. But it the, the story about what I do all comes comes clear now. And so Bud's team was a lot stronger after this. As a matter of fact, Bud, uh, I talked to Bud some, oh, a couple months after this, and, and he said that was, that was absolutely life-changing for everyone on the team. And so sometimes if people can see truly what is going on in a team, there is a lot of revelation. You know, it's almost like serendipitous uh, learning that's taking place. Well, here are some guidelines for effective planning. Um, and and we suggest these time, these planning things uh, as we, we do the jungle escape exercise, uh, that, that people really understand the task. Um, and and it, people assess their the members' experience and skill in, in doing that task. And, they define their time frames clearly, schedules, and people's role and responsibilities. Are, I like the, the next one a lot. They, they surface and identify problems that might occur. What are their risks? What, what are things that could go wrong with what they're working on or things that would be a downside? And uh, determining who coordinates what team efforts and establishing measurements for their work, uh, ways for them to be able to give feedback to each other. Um, I worked with, uh, some years ago, a chemical company, and I was brought in. There was a cross-functional uh, kind of uh, improvement team. They, they were doing a little bit of reorg and a little bit of reengineering and all kinds of stuff. And they had worked together almost two years. 
And the, uh, the uh, director of this team called me in and said, they just, this was another kind of retreat thing. He said, they'd been working together. They just need to step back and look at their processes of how they work. And so I suggested uh, the, uh, the exercise we're going to look at. And uh, that exercise, Jungle Escape, helped them see how they do things. So when we got together, the 12 people were put into two teams of six. I gave them each a helicopter to put together, uh, ran through the rules of this. And right away, one of the people on one of the teams said to me, hey, we're supposed to be one team. Why don't we all work together? And someone at the other table said, well, you just don't want us to beat you. Uh, you, you just think we're going to do better than you. And, and so you're afraid of losing this. And the guy was sincere. He said, no, maybe we can learn some more about planning if we sit and plan this exercise together. And that team decided to move the two tables together and work together on building two helicopters at once. Well, they took six minutes to plan, and I hardly ever see a team take that long to plan. But they did an extremely good job of planning. And these are some of the things they really did a good job with, especially that one I mentioned, uh, identify problems that could occur in trying to build this. And they they asked them, one of the best questions in the world to ask for a, a team getting together is, what's going to be difficult about what we're doing? And I remember them asking that question and smiling because that's a key question with any type of teamwork. What's going to be difficult about what we're doing? And sure enough, they talked about it. And after six minutes, they were ready to start building. Well, they worked so fast in building, I was just shocked. And they completed it in less than six minutes. So they did in less than 12 minutes. They built something that normally takes people around 25 uh, teams, around 25 minutes to build. Um so uh, it really surprised me how much planning makes a difference. And here's one of the things that that I learned from this, and they, they saw too, is that they had been planning together for a year and a half or so. They understood each other. They understood things. They understood problems. They understood how to sit together and really listen to each other. Um, and so their planning was extraordinary. Um, and so when I when I work with teams, I, I like to help them see here are the things we have to do to kind of work together. And what this all does, if we really plan, planning works because it, it shortens cycle times, it reduces errors, it increases work satisfaction. It it helps us kind of envision what we're about to do. So planning does work, and we just have to figure out how to plan for what work we are going to do. Um, now, at HRDQ, uh, we love experiential learning. We believe that teams can learn the most about themselves if they go through an experience that shows their true colors. So for teams, as we're trying to help them learn how to uh, develop themselves, we we want them to understand how to move from fragmented to cohesiveness. We want them to determine which of the nine elements need improvement on their team. We want them to appreciate each person's individual style of working, like even Bud. I think the team started appreciating Bud's style of working, which is being a completer, not an initiator. And And once they understood that, it helped them. And it helps to define future actions that the team needs for their own personal development. And so when we do Jungle Escape, these are some team development guidelines that we work around and want them to do. But also each team member needs some individual development guidelines. And uh, we want them to learn how to compare their individual interaction to their on-the-job behaviors. What is it they do on the job? Um, we help them look at action planning their own individual responsibilities for team improvement because each person has their own responsibility. Uh, we help them have insight into how their team can work better together. And uh, we help them have 
personal insights into how I work on this team, like Bud and his team had after their experience. So this is where Jungle Escape comes in. We believe Jungle Escape shows the true colors of any team because people's natural behavior comes out so quickly and vividly during this exercise. Here's Jungle Escape. The scenario is basically this. Um, imagine that your team is flying in a, in a plane somewhere and you crash land in a jungle and you're on a mission to deliver helicopter parts to a secret military base. And unfortunately in this jungle, your chances of being located and rescued are very minimal. But you've managed to salvage these helicopter parts. And so you may be able to construct an escape chopper. <clears throat> so that's basically the scenario. It's a little bit of fun. <clears throat> and when I do it, as a matter of fact, I have a lot of fun. I wear this kind of uh, fatigues, military fatigues, and uh, kind of imagine that we're on a secret military mission. Uh, and and sometimes uh, I'm working with clients who decorate the room in certain ways uh, or even have bananas on the table as if they're in the jungle. Uh, so it's a fun kind of way to kind of get people involved and engaged. So here's how the 30-minute team simulation works. Participants are divided into teams of, I like, four to eight participants. And each team is given a kit. Uh, containing 97 pieces to make a helicopter. And they get, they get some information about the helicopter. And so first the team plans how they're going to build the helicopter. And then the team assembles an airworthy copter. So the action may start slowly, <clears throat> but it builds. The teams are frantic to survive, or at least to beat the other teams in the room. Now, <clears throat> Here's what happens. Teams are going to start as fragmented teams. They're going to <clears throat> start in very fragmented ways. <clears throat> One team member is often going to take charge and become sort of an autocratic leader, uh, unless the team works naturally, like that chemical company team I told you about, that cross functional team, where everyone was sort of a team leader. Uh, People will tend not to disagree with anything that's said. And people will look for a job they can do all by themselves, like build the rotor or build the rear rotor or build the landing gear, et cetera. And, and at first, it feels sort of awkward and confusing as, as we're looking at the pieces and trying to figure out what to do. So there's a lot of the things that are the nine elements of fragmentation. Uh, and it's easy to observe those. Uh, we sometimes have a team observer. If there's fewer teams in the room, I do the observing. And I look for things that happen to show that at first they're being fragmented. Now, after they do the planning, which often for teams, they don't know what to do to plan. And they're often after one minute, they say, we're done planning. Uh, even though they've done no planning and don't even realize it, uh, they start to build. Okay, so here's the building. Uh, it's often very strangely quiet in the room for a little bit, as each person just works by themselves. There's little communication between people. Um, and, and there's signs of fragmentation that are really obvious, as each person is just kind of trying to do their individual job. And there's no feeling of connectedness or teamwork or interdependence or anything when the team starts in this fragmented way. Now, like I said, that, that cross-functional team, you know, uh, some years ago at the chemical company, they shocked me because there was no fragmentation from the very beginning. They were already a cohesive team. And it's very different than what you'll see in this picture where everyone's, everyone's quiet, not saying anything. So people work individually, build their part of the helicopter. Now, there's a transition point that starts happening. All of a sudden, people realize, hey, we've got to work together to assemble this copter. We've got to figure out how are we going to do this? And at that point, all of a sudden, the room becomes a lot noisier. 
There's open communication. There's asking questions. There's giving feedback. Uh, no, don't do it this way. Do it that way. And and critique becomes the norm. It's interesting. People correct each other, but they often don't feel like they're correcting each other. They feel like they're adding improvements. And the concern now starts becoming uh, the goal. What is this final product going to be? How are the individual pieces that people have been working on? How are they all going to fit in? And so now they're starting to be all these questions and dialogue between each other. So that's then the transition point to the team possibly becoming very cohesive. Now, let's back up for just one minute. Um, there are some ground rules, and let's just kind of say, here are the ground rules. Uh, the ground rules are to take whatever time your team wants to plan the assembly. Like I said, a lot of teams just take one minute or two minutes. It's rare when a, a team will take three, four, five, and like I said, that one team took six minutes to plan. They did amazing in their planning. And so it increased their planning time, but it reduced their assembly time by doing this. Um, and so, you know, they, they then start timing themselves after they begin. And they're told that one person from their team can go look at a model and report back to the team what to do. Um, and so that's sort of the way they start this game when, when they start. Now, here's a team I worked with recently. Uh, notice this team is at that transition point. They, they are at the point where they have to start becoming cohesive. Individuals have worked on their individual product. Okay, they had their part done. And now they've started talking to each other about what to do next. Right after this, there was a whole lot of team energy starting to figure out how to do this. Um, let's show another team here. Here's a team that's almost done, but they're still confused about how they get the landing gear and the tail section together. And this is where, for this team, a little frustration set in and disagreement started occurring. And they're, they're talking to each other and disagreeing with each other. Um, and what was interesting with this team is when the exercise was over, I asked them if there was any conflict on this team. And they all said real quickly, no, no, no conflict. However, I read back to them some of the disagreements they had had right at this point. And they, they realized, yeah, we did disagree, uh, but they saw it and, and uh, a cohesive team will start seeing this as healthy disagreement. And that helped them in the last, oh, four or five minutes that they work together, it helped them quickly figure out what they need, needed to do. And what happens is a team that's getting to that cohesive point, they do not feel like there's disagreement and no one takes different opinions personally. Now, if they were still pretty fragmented, they would have had feelings hurt by disagreement, by people disagreeing with what they say. And so it's one of those signs that a team has moved into a more cohesive state when people feel free to disagree and really uh, voice different opinions. Um, so this was really an, an interesting team about how strongly they thought there was no disagreement when in fact, I noticed a lot of disagreement on this team. Let me show you another team. I thought this was interesting. This team was very successful. This was a very diverse team. Everyone in this picture was born in a different country. Each had a different native language. And each of them had a different kind of English accent. Uh, starting from the right here, they were born in Iran, Canada, Japan, Brazil, and Honduras. But they're all now working on an international team in the United States. But what was interesting is they all were, by nature of their jobs, they were planners. Uh, and they were planning, as a matter of fact, on a project that I think was somewhere in the range of uh, $300 million project for a power plant uh, in another country. And uh, so they had been working together for a while. And it was interesting uh, this way because uh, they worked in a very cohesive manner, manner 
to plan, and then they worked in a very cohesive manner throughout this exercise. Uh, they did not fragment much at all in the beginning of this exercise. And they were looking to each other for ideas all the way from the beginning, very open to ideas from each other. It was interesting, one guy on this team, they were using words he didn't know, and he kept having to look in his translator. He had a, he had a translator on his desk with him. And he kept looking up words. What what is that word? <laughs> you know, and, and uh, it was fun because I was so impressed with the fact that they had some cohesion built into this team already that helped them do such a great job, even though they didn't speak each other's language. Uh, maybe you have teams that don't seem to speak each other's language. Well, uh, getting together and doing some team building might be the thing for them to do. Now, in the last, here's a summary of the last few minutes uh, of what happened, and and most teams becoming extremely cohesive. There, there's an intensive drive at the end towards completion. Everyone is trying to work together. No egos involved, and and they're all giving each other suggestions quickly, and the focus is on the team goal at this point of completing the helicopter, not upon what individually people have done. And, and at this point, you rarely, if ever, will see a single leader. But everyone is taking some initiative uh, to lead in some way and something different. And there's this feeling of excitement as it's all coming together and, and they feel like they have accomplished this as a team. So this is, uh, this is sort of the end of the 30 minutes that they have together. And some teams can complete this in 25 minutes and, and we often have good teams that complete it in 20 minutes even. Uh, so like I said, it was amazing when I saw a team complete it in 12 minutes. Uh, it shows that that team has a lot of cohesion and working in a very cohesive, cohesive way. So learning takes place. Learning takes place uh, for these reasons. Uh, uh, learning takes place because the team understands that maybe they didn't do a good job of planning. And they understand a little bit more about when the team gets together, here are some questions they need to ask about their planning. And, and learning takes place around assembly, that is working together. Um, and, and some way they've got to figure out how can we work best together? And so we're concerned about total time reduction in terms of how we work together. Uh, learning takes place because, um, because there's a lot of self insight. Because once they're finished, they look back and look at what they did and they, they replay those tapes in their head about what was done and what was said and how quiet it was at the beginning of the exercise and, and how I would, uh, someone would say, I was surprised because uh, she stepped up and I've never seen her do what she did. And it, it was interesting, you know, and so people see the sides of people that come out, their natural behavior, and it helps them think through how they can use more of their natural behavior on the team to uh, actually do better. So at the end of the exercise, after the helicopter's Built. We set it in the middle of the table, and then we asked some debriefing questions. Uh, here are some samples of some debriefing questions uh, out of the many that we asked. How does our performance as a team in this activity mirror the way we work together on the job? There's always a lot of discussion around that, what we did or what, what, uh, what this person did or that person did. Um, what lessons did I learn that would help my team work together more effectively in the future? So what can the team do to work more effectively is the second question here. Uh, and then the next question, based upon what I learned, what action steps will I recommend my team take on its next project? What am I going to do to help the team? And then here's another great one. It's and this is what personal insights am I taking away from this activity, especially about myself? You know, and that's where it really gets kind of deep for people. So like Bud earlier, Bud had so much insight that day into himself. 
and how it impacted the people that reported to him. He did not realize how, how his behavior was negatively impacting them. Uh, and so he came up with a lot of ideas about how he could work better with each of the people that worked for him and how the whole team could work together in a much more cohesive way. There are more questions too we asked, but here are some of the, uh, here are four big, uh, big trigger questions that really get the team thinking about themselves. Um, and then the action planning. We asked people to write down, what am I gonna do differently? What is the team gonna do differently? Set some goals for themselves uh, and, and just do some planning around the team process. That really helps the team learn. So um, what we're gonna do here is uh, examine questions. Sarah, I bet there's been some questions come in. I kind of ran through this a little fast. So uh, what kind of questions uh, would people have that have been coming in? Sure. Thank you so much, Gary. We we actually do have questions already. So um, if you have a question, we have time here for questions. Go ahead and type those in now while we're answering some of the other questions. Um, we'll get started, though, right away because we, we do have a couple that have come in. So our, our first question is from Elaine. She asks, uh, what happens when you have the opposite of bud so you ask for input but no one wants to contribute how do you kind of get them motivated okay so by the opposite of bud elaine i'm assuming you mean someone that doesn't get their hands involved doesn't get engaged with what other people in the team are doing well that that's great because what you're going to end up seeing and it happens sometimes is you're going to have that folded arm person uh, who kind of sits back and doesn't get engaged very much uh, and uh, doesn't say very much. Now, um, it, it, this is a great opportunity for the team to see it and for the team to give feedback to that person. Uh, the team must have a very serious problem with their interaction if that person is not engaged and this needs to be surfaced and addressed. So uh, you may want even an experienced facilitator to help this team, to, to work with this team. But uh, so one thing you might do here too is uh, HRDQ has a team effectiveness profile. Uh, and the team might take this profile before they meet and for the facilitator to see people's results on it and, and get a, a composite profile of the team. Um, one of the teams I worked with uh, not long ago, uh, I was warned before I went to it that, that people don't speak up very much. So I facilitated an issue session for them. And what I used is a technique called brain writing. And what we did is we handed cards around and people would write down issues on the brain, uh, of, out of their brain that they just thought the team had. And then they would hand the cards to the to the right or the left and, and people would read what they said and then write something else down. And then they would hand it around again. And it was interesting, we, we, we were just going a couple minutes and all of a sudden things erupted and everyone started talking and there was a little bit of anger that came out at that point. Uh, but uh, that's a technique, uh, if no one's talkers, they're not talkers, at least maybe they're writers. And it might be a method you use here, but I but I can say this: Jungle Escape will show again true colors. It'll show a lot of what is happening with people on the team. Sarah, any other questions? Uh, yep, we have we have a few more that have come in. Um, uh, re, so this one's regarding fragmented teams. Uh, what steps can we take to bring this type of team to a cohesive team definition? Okay, uh, well, uh, you know, the complexity of the nine elements of effective teamwork has got to be part of this. And sometimes it's hard to know where to start with that and what will keep moving the team forward. If you're a, if you're a team member or a consultant to this team, what I suggest is you keep evaluating against anchors of those nine elements. Um, all nine are interdependent, uh, 
But the one I like to start with, I, I like to start a lot of times with the fourth one, that is clear goals and objectives. Uh, and just see what the team has as their goals and how much team members feel like it is a common goal. Like uh, all orders have to be shipped out by Friday or uh, we have to raise our customer service score by three points. Or if, if the team really feels that and is committed to that, that will be often a first step toward wanting to pull together. Um, so uh, another thing that I think helps is meaningful involvement in that, in that number, that's the second one of the nine elements, uh, that people need to feel like what they do on the team is a part of what's going on. Uh, like they're integral part of what is really happening with that team. It's hard to start being cohesive unless there's a strong feeling of some ownership and, and inclusion, like I'm a part of this team. Uh, other questions, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we have one here from Sandra. Um, how do you get buy-in from employees who don't feel these exercises are of any value? Uh, did you say it was from Sandra? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sandra. Okay, Sandra. Um, well, there's a couple things, Sandra. Well, first of all, I like to use the word simulation. You know, a lot of people, uh, I, I know I'm tempted to call them games, but this is a simulation of real work. It, it simulates what happens at work. And for the employees who don't feel like these exercises have any, any value, um, it, you've got to tell them that this will help bring out our true colors, the way we really work. Um, now, uh, some employees work in very independent jobs, uh, like people maybe in some specialized technology and they just do their own thing. And, and in that case, building cohesion is a lot tougher to do. Uh, they, they often see less valuable value in being part of a team and they see more value in just them being personally efficient in what they do. So where people do work together or have uh, similar stakeholders or they have similar products or they have similar type of processes, um, they, they have some problems working together and the team needs to understand that there's a, there's a value in developing their teamwork. So Sandra, buy-in often comes from showing people why they need to work well together. And then a little bit about how they can work better together. Um, so like I mentioned, I, I've seen a team that does work well together. I've seen a lot of teams that work well together in, in truth, but uh, uh, so uh, it really helps a team You've got to tell your team that it really helps them work quicker, efficiently, effectively. And intu intuitively, we know that this principle is true, that, that people can work better together. Um, one other thought is that you won't get 100% of the people you want to go through this exercise to believe that it's going to be valuable. I, a lot of people are going to have some doubts from the beginning. So you might just ask them to trust you at this time and try it. Uh, might be a way that you approach this. Uh, Sarah? Great. Thank you so much, Gary. That's um, that's all the questions we've got that have come in now. Um, so if for some reason you think of a question uh, later or, um, you know, right here as we're wrapping up, feel free to send those in to us or you can reach out to HRDQ directly. Now, I know there's some new people on the line to HRDQ, so I just want to introduce us. We are a research-based experiential learning products company. Um, you can check out our online or print self-assessments, our up-out-of-your-seat games like the Jungle Escape, the foundation of today's webinar. We also have reproducible workshops that you can customize. And if you do find you need help either learning a training program or you want one of our expert trainers like Gary to come on site um, or virtually deliver it for you, we also provide those services. So we look forward to being your soft skills training resource. And Gary, thank you so much for sharing all your wonderful stories today. Well, thank you, Sarah. I enjoyed being here. 
And thanks everyone for participating. We'll see you on our next webinar. Happy training.